Hi, welcome to my channel, Math Made Easy with Laurel. I'm Laurel, and in this video, we're going to talk about solving equations. In many fields, including the trades, you're going to encounter formulas, and you may have to rearrange those formulas or solve those equations for one of the variables in the formula. So the basic rule when you're solving an equation is you're going to isolate the unknown that you're asked to solve for. So that will probably be a variable or a letter. And the way that you're going to isolate that letter or variable is you're going to perform certain operations, which will be inverse operations, on the equation as long as it's on both sides of the equation. The key thing to remember is that whatever you do to one side of the equation, you have to do the same thing to the other side of the equation, so both sides remain balanced. So they both remain equal to each other. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about with some examples. So if we were asked to solve for x here, and I know that x plus 3 equals 10, and I'm wondering what x must be equal to to make this, e this equation true, what I'm going to do is isolate the x. Right now it has a 3 being added to it, so in order to eliminate that 3 that's being added, I perform the inverse operation, and the inverse operation to addition is subtraction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract a 3, and that will eliminate it on this side of the equation. But whatever I do to this side, I have to do the same thing to the other side. 3 minus 3 is gone, so I'll just be left with an x. 10 minus 3 is 7. The next example, t minus 4 equals 5. If I was asked to solve for t, want to get t by itself. Right now there is a 4 being subtracted, so the inverse operation to subtraction is addition. So if I add 4 to this side of the equation, a minus 4 plus a 4 will disappear, but if I add something to this side, I have to do the same thing to the other side, and I'm just going to have t equals 9. And you can always go back and put that value into the original equation to see if it makes it true. If you have a coefficient and a variable, that operation is assumed to be multiplication. When you have things written beside each other in a formula, it means that they're being multiplied to each other. So 5 is being multiplied to the x, and the inverse operation of multiplication is division. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by 5. Whatever I do to this side, I must do the same thing to the other side. The 5 will cancel and I will be left with x equals 20 divided by 5 is 4. Now I can do more and more examples of just general equations, but what I want to do is look at specific formulas that you're going to see in different trades so that it makes it a little more interesting. This formula represents Ohm's law, which you would encounter if you were doing anything with electricity, and E represents the voltage, I represents current, R represents resistance. So let's say we knew certain values. For example, if we knew that the voltage was 120, and let's say that we know the current I is five, and if we were to find resistance, we're going to use the same process that we did in the last example. We want R by itself. In order to do that, I need to get rid of this five. This five is multiplied to the R, so in order to eliminate it or get rid of it, I need to divide. And if I do that to the right side of the equation, I have to do it to the left side as well. So the fives will cancel. I will be left with R and 120 divided by five is 24. Another formula that you might see is the formula for mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage for any kind of system is always defined as the load which is the output force divided by the effort, which is the input force. So let's say we knew the mechanical advantage was, let's say, 20 to 1, which is, we could just write that as 20. The load we are finding, and let's say our effort is 10. So in order to solve for L, or the load, it's being divided by 10. The inverse or opposite operation of division is multiplication. So I'm going to multiply this side by 10. Whatever I do to this side, I need to do the same thing to the other side. So I'm going to have 10 times 20, which is 200, will equal the 10 cancels here, L. 
So in other words, if I had a system that had a mechanical advantage of 20 to one, and I had an input force of 10 pounds, my output force would be 200 pounds. Let's do another mechanical advantage question, but this time, let's say we don't know the effort. So if our mechanical advantage is 50, or can, can also be known as 50 to one, and our load is 1500, we want to find effort. The problem is that our unknown is in the denominator and we can't solve it when it's in the denominator. So there's two ways we can approach this. One way is first of all to get it out of the denominator and the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by an E. I can do that as long as I'm doing the same thing to both sides. The E will cancel on this side and I'll have 50 times E on this side. Now it's out of the denominator, I can solve for E. I just need to eliminate this 50 that's being multiplied to E, and the way that I do that is I divide by 50. If I do that to that side, I need to do it to this side as well. 50 will cancel, and 1500 divided by 50 is 30. So that's one way that you could approach that equation, but there's also another way that you might find easier. If you have an equation like this, you can think of 50 as being 50 over 1, and that's actually what mechanical advantage means. It means that you can lift 50 pounds of load for every one pound of effort. When you have two fractions equal to each other, there's a bit of a shortcut that we can do that you've probably heard about. It's called cross multiplying. And the way that that works is you multiply across the diagonal. So 50 times E will equal the product of this diagonal, one times 1500. Now, in order to solve for E, again, we divide both sides by 50, and we get E equals 30. So you might find it a little bit easier to write 50 as 50 over one and cross multiply, rather than going through the steps I did in the first way I did it. In this next example, it's the formula for circumference of a circle. Often we'll know the diameter and we multiply diameter to pi to get circumference, but you might instead be given circumference and be asked to find pi. Let's say the circumference is 60 centimeters, inches, it doesn't really matter. We're not gonna worry about units. And we wanna find the diameter of the circle whose circumference is 60. Pi represents a very specific number, 3.14159 and so on. The point is it's not a variable. We're not solving for pi. We already know what pi is. It's just a number. We want to solve for d given the circumference. So in order to isolate d, we're going to get rid of pi. Pi is being multiplied to d, so we're going to divide by it. And whatever we do to one side, we do the same thing to the other side. So the pi will cancel and we'll be left with d on this side. And then we're going to take 60 and divide by pi and we get 19.1 rounded off. This next formula is Fahrenheit will be equal to 1.8 times Celsius plus 32. So we're using it to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. But you might instead be given Fahrenheit and be asked to find Celsius. So let's say Fahrenheit temperature is 90 degrees and we want to know what the equivalent is in Celsius. So this equation is a little bit different because we have something that's added to this term plus we have multiplication here. So always isolate the term containing your unknown first. Before we worry about this 1.8, let's deal with the 32. It's being added, so in order to get rid of it, we're gonna subtract 32. It's gonna be gone from this side, but we also have to remember to subtract 32 from this side. So 90 minus 32 will be 58. and it's gone from this side. So now we have 58 equals 1.8 C. Now we can solve for C once this term is by itself. We do what we were doing before. We're gonna divide both sides by 1.8, and we get 32.2. So 90 degrees Fahrenheit would be equivalent to 32.2 degrees Celsius. You may encounter formulas that have more than just two variables. So let's take a look at volume of a rectangular solid. And in this case, let's say we know the volume, we know the length, and we know the width, and we want to find the height. For example, 
I maybe have a volume of 120 cubic inches or cubic centimeters. And let's say that the length is six inches or centimeters. The width is, let's say five, whatever the unit is, and we wanna find the height. So five times six is 30. So we have 30 times H. In order to get rid of that 30, we're gonna divide by 30. Whatever we do to this side of the equation, we do it to this side as well. So we're gonna get H equals four. Sometimes you will encounter a variable that has a power and you'll be asked to solve for that variable. For example, this is the formula for area of a circle. And if we knew that the area was 100 square units and we wanted to find the radius, what we're gonna do first is isolate the radius squared. Don't worry about that power just yet. Let's get rid of the pi that's being multiplied. And to do that, we're gonna divide both sides by pi. So we'll cancel here. And that will be 31.83. That's what r squared is equal to. We want to know what r is equal to. So in order to isolate r or to get r to the power of 1, we're going to do the inverse of squaring. And the inverse of squaring is square rooting. So that's the inverse operation. And if I square root the right-hand side, I have to also square root the left-hand side. If I take the square root of r squared, that's simply R. And if I take the square root of 31.83, I will get 5.64. So a circle with an area of 100 square units will have a radius of 5.64, whatever that unit is. Similarly, if we were looking at volume of a cylinder, which is pi times the radius squared times the height of the cylinder, and if we knew the volume was, let's say, 900 cubic units, and we knew the height was 10. We could find radius, but we're just going to do one thing at a time. I'm going to write this in a different order. I'm going to write this as pi times 10 times radius squared. I'm just going to put that at the end. This is being multiplied to r squared, so I'm going to divide that side by pi times 10. I'm going to divide this side by pi times 10. We'll cancel here, and I'll be left with r squared. Now be very careful how you punch this into your calculator. If you punch it in as 900 divided by pi times 10, it will not be correct, because it will divide by pi, and then it will take that result and multiply by 10. So there's a few things that you can do to get it correct. You can either just divide by pi and then divide by 10, because you're dividing by both of those factors, or you can multiply those together first and then divide 900 by that. Or you could use brackets, 900 divided by, in brackets, pi times 10, end of brackets. Whatever way you did it on your calculator, you should have got 28.65. That's equal to r squared. We do the same process as we did in the last example. To find r, we take the square root of this side to get r. And if I take the square root of this side, I must take the square root of this side. So we should get 5.35 units as our result. If you were doing calculations involving belt speeds, for example, or any kind of circular speed, whether it's cutting speed, belt speed, drill speed, and so on, you might see this formula. Belt speed will equal pi times the diameter times the RPM, not, I'm using a capital R which represents RPM, not radius, divided by 12. Let's say we know the belt speed that is required and the diameter that's given, and we want to know what RPM should be. Again, there's a couple of different ways that we can approach this equation. One thing that we can do is take this whole thing and get one number. We can take pi times 6, divide by 12, and multiply that to r. And that will be 1.57 times r. Now I'm going to keep the value on my calculator. I just wrote it down, rounded off. Now in order to solve for r, I'm going to divide by 1.57 or I'm going to divide by the value that's on my calculator. And I'll do the same thing to this side. And I get a value of 318. 
There are other methods that we could use to solve this. Again, it's personal preference. Some people might prefer to multiply both sides by 12 to get rid of the denominator. If you do that, the 12 will cancel here, and we'll end up with 6,000 here, and I have 6 pi times r. Again, we want to divide by 6 times pi, but you could do it individually. You could divide both sides by 6, first of all, and that will give you 1,000 will equal pi times r. Then you could divide by pi to get 318. Or you could have divided by pi times 6 at this point. So there's lots of different approaches to solving equations. Just make sure that whatever you do to one side of the equation, you're doing to the other side. And also I would suggest that you don't round off as you're going. Keep the values that you find on your calculator, store them in the memory, and then recall them to use them to do further calculations. Yeah.